we have to talk about Star Wars. That's right. I have been in the Star Wars arc reviewing Star Wars movie after Star Wars movie after Star Wars movie. You can see them all on my channel. Uh, the thumbnails are beyond incredible. You guys, if you go watch my Star Wars things, you get to see some of the coolest. I mean, just take a look. Let me just show you real quick, okay? Let me just show you the the severity of how awesome my thumbnails are, okay? Take a look at this. Look at that Thumbnail. Look at that thumbnail. You tell me that is not an incredible thumbnail, okay? We are in, my lovely imps, the Star Wars arc in which I review every Star Wars movie that I can tolerate until I'm burned out on Star Wars once again. And the reason for this, of course, was inspired by the incredible show Star Wars Andor, which I will be doing a review for uh, in due time. Uh, which it is my single favorite piece of Star Wars media. Star Wars and or it single-handedly reignited my love for Star Wars. Um, after years of feeling uh, uh, burnt out on Star Wars for very good reason, which we are going to get into. But today, we are going to review Return of the Jedi, the legendary film, the legendary third Star Wars movie, uh, which some people consider to be the best Star Wars movie, and other people consider Empire Strikes Back to be the best Star Wars movie. And I, I have a lot of opinions. So this is gonna be a very interesting and a very political review because I have a lot of things to talk about with regard to uh, Return of the Jedi. Now, some of you might know uh, the lore behind the Star Wars movie, Return of the Jedi, which is that it was actually originally going to be called Revenge of the Jedi, which is kind of hilarious uh, <laughs> because I don't really, like, to to be honest, that seems like it really undermines the, 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 the thematic... Uh, message of Return of the Jedi that the, re <laughs> the Jedi are getting revenge um, but uh, it, but that's what it was originally going to be called now of course we all know now that that was scrapped and that they brought the naming convention back for the prequel movie Revenge of the Sith um, but uh, uh, this is a movie that uh it's interesting in, in a lot of ways because Re Return of the Jedi is the first movie where you really start to get the feel of a, what is like a, a prototypical version of the cinematic universe. And it's, it's weird because I don't entirely hate it. Um, you guys all who watch my channel regularly uh, will know is that I am pretty damn critical of uh, of cinematic universes as a concept. Um, the way that they unfold in the sort of modern time is, is that uh, cinematic universes are basically uh, nostalgia milking machines uh, that, that everybody is sort of uh, hooked onto and it just sort of milks away, milking and milking until the people turn into little shriveled husks. Uh, the fans turn into little shriveled husks who don't recognize themselves when they look in the mirror um pretty much every cinematic universe in existence is basically that uh including by the way star wars however um the 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 sort of core idea uh behind a cinematic universe is of course something that many people enjoy um uh like for example, before the, the the capital cinematic universe, the capital letters cinematic universe concept existed, we have all kinds of uh, of fictional universes that are incredible. Let me give an example: Lord of the Rings. Everybody was like Lord of the Rings was a global sensation, and Lord of the Rings is one of those universes where. Uh, you could make an entire Wikipedia, and in fact, of course, there are now entire Wikipedias that are entirely devoted uh, to 
aspects of the lore of that universe because there's just so much stuff, so much world building and love and uh, and and pieces of work that take place in that universe that have built off the original series. And uh, they're really cool. There's something unique about uh, about fictional universes that go beyond just a single story or even beyond a single series, but go into a uh, a world uh, that, that has a history, that has a fictionally entirely made up history. There's something magical about that, even if we know where some of them go. Um, yeah, so... Uh, 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 yeah, Lord of the Rings is, is like a great example of this. Now, in Star Wars, when you're watching, uh, uh, A New Hope, and then afterwards maybe you decide to watch Empire Strikes Back, those movies don't feel like they are, uh, like they are trying to plug into a greater universe. But Return of the Jedi does. Return of the Jedi is the first movie where it starts to feel like, ah, we want to build this into a much bigger story where we intend to sort of color in all of the specifics. And with it comes some, some missed steps, but also some pretty incredible uh, uh, storyline flourishes. When I talked about A New Hope, uh, one of the things that I mentioned is that it's kind of shallow. Uh, a New Hope is a great film. I absolutely adore A New Hope. I love the movie. I think it's super entertaining. Uh, it's very endearing. The special effects uh, are wonderful, of course. A lot of love was put into them. Uh, the cinematography is great. Uh, the acting, the, every single person is putting their whole heart into the acting. It's great. It's awesome. A New Hope is great. But there's a certain level at which you you realize that it's basically just a space adventure story. There, uh, most of the structures don't have any depth to them. They're sort of like props. The Emperor is a great example of this. In A New Hope, the Emperor, you know, ah, unlimited power, we know the Emperor. Uh, the Emperor doesn't ever have an appearance. He doesn't even have a name. He's just called the Emperor. He is a, a figure that exists uh, off screen, like a, uh, like a, like a, a painting, a, a backdrop in a, in a, uh, in a, in a theater sketch. He's n nothing other than a sort of uh, a spooky thing that exists in the background to, to sort of add color. And of course, we start to see that change in uh, Empire Strikes Back, but not that much. In Empire Strikes Back, uh, you you see like a like a. a, a a holograph, a hologram of the of the emperor, and you start to see some of the emperor's uh, guards, but you don't actually see the emperor. It's in Return of the Jedi, the film that we're talking about right now, that you start to see the real depth that they intend to fill in in the Star Wars universe. The Emperor himself appears. You see how his projects start to work. You start to see a little more of the structure of the Empire, the effects the Empire has on planets beyond uh, uh, the ones that are relevant to our main characters. And I like it. Um, uh... I, I, I have to say, I think it's pretty enjoyable. And I think that it adds um, a lot to, to Return of the Jedi. Uh, and also, it kind of counteracts what a lot of people say about Star Wars. Um, which is, of course, when you hear people talk about Star Wars a lot, and I, I think, have even made this mistake in the past, uh, people go, oh, the original trilogy was great because they were just space adventure movies. Um, and that's all. And people kind of chalk it up that, like, oh, keep it simple, stupid. That, like, that is what made the original trilogy good. But that's not true. And, and Return of the Jedi kind of proves that it's not true, that it's just because they're space adventure movies that makes them great. It actually kind of proves the opposite, that you actually can start to build a more richly detailed universe in cinema on a film screen and still have it land really well and still be a great movie. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, so... Uh, 
anyway, uh, that's just my sort of opening ram ramble about, about the return of the Jedi. Now I want to talk about the progression of the story, the things that I loved about Return of the Jedi, and what I think uh, sort of solidifies Return of the Jedi as such a solidly good uh, uh, Star Wars movie. Um, uh, but before I do that, if you are here and you are enjoying this so far, please, my lovely, lovely imps and soon-to-be imps, Go on down, press the like button, press subscribe, and ring the bell. My channel is booming. Uh, we have been doing a lot of new content on the channel, including these videos. So your likes, subscriptions, and comments mean the world. Because these videos have been very fun for me to make, and they've been very fun for you all to watch. Uh, and I'd love to have more of you here. So press like, press subscribe, and comment down in the comments with your thoughts about the movies, or anything supportive, or even critical. All right, there you go. Uh, anyway, uh, Return of the Jedi. So Return of the Jedi opens with, um, with a super high intrigue, basically a spy movie kind of plot. Uh, uh, you have the, the fortress of the crime lord Jabba the Hutt. And, uh, one of the things I love about Jabba the Hutt's palace is that they really sell it's it work it sells very well as like a crime lord atmosphere there's like live music playing it's implied there's drugs all over the place uh th there's literally a scene that people forget about in return of the jedi which is that they all just kind of fall asleep where they're partying um the the like Jabba's palace is like a perpetual party and literally the Gamorreans everybody just falls asleep on the floor when they're done partying they're like you know Jabba's like oh blah, 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 blah. and and then there's the music playing you know they've got a uh, uh, salacious B crumb and the mushroom head guy and the singing lady and they're all doing all their stuff and then they all just kind of like crash in his giant palace on the pillows and blankets that are all around. It reminded me, I kept thinking of Jesse's house in uh, Breaking Bad. I know that's a bit of a, of, of a track jump to reference Breaking Bad. But there's a, uh, if anybody's seen Breaking Bad, uh, 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 there's this part where Jesse basically is, is like, tr he's, he's insanely rich at this point from all the money that he's been making from his drug dealing, but he hates his life. And so he turns his house into like a, a, a perpetual party zone and it's a nightmare. Uh, and honestly, it kind of reminds me of that. Um, it's great. It's, it's great. His, Jabba's uh, palace truly comes off as like a den of crime and villainy uh, where uh, he sits on top of a mountain of slavery riches because you have to remember that it's been well established that the way that Jabba the Hutt makes his money is by extorting the people of Tatooine and literally trading in slavery. Uh, that's his business. Uh, and uh, it's great. It works really well. And the what's actually going on in the story is, of course, that... Um, you know, Han Solo has been frozen in carbonite for an indeterminate period of time and is being displayed on his wall as a trophy. And all of these different people are uh, in, have infiltrated Jabba's palace to try and rescue him. You have Luke who, uh, you know, comes in very openly and is like, I am a Jedi Knight. I'm here to parlay for my friend. But then you have both Leia and, uh, and Lando disguised as members of, of Jabba's staff. And it's cool because, um, uh, if you guys will recall in my review of Revenge of the Sith, one of my complaints was that uh, Star Wars, as time goes on, uh, like, like in, in, as our time goes on, you know, as, as the movies go on, Star Wars loses its sense of time. Um, in the old Star Wars movies, it, it always seems like there's time passing between, uh, which, between major scenes. If they're flying from one part of the galaxy to another part of the galaxy, time passes. Uh, and, uh, that's present in all of these original ones. And it's even present in uh, uh, The Phantom Menace. And then it starts to completely unravel and things happen immediately with seemingly no time actually tra like traversing. But in this case, 
uh, when you come in to, like cold into the beginning of Return of the Jedi, it's like, oh, well, it would have taken time for Lando to be able to get a job uh, on on Jabba's staff. It would have taken time for Leia to to uh, become a, a secret bounty hunter and get all of the weaponry necessary. So you get a, a real sense with only a few scant details that time has passed since the end of the last movie. And I like that. I think it's great. It adds a lot of color and depth to the universe that they are par participating in. Now, uh, this, of course, uh, you know, the whole sequence of events that happens in Jabba's palace is, in my opinion, very fun. There is a ton of uh, of uh, special effects, uh, mostly puppetry uh, and, uh, uh, and prosthetics on display. Like, it, it, they go all out. And this is something that's not present even in the last two Star Wars movies. I think Return of the Jedi is really the movie that probably made uh, uh, Star Wars famous for the the amount of like puppetry and and some people you know like literal Muppets uh, in some cases uh, uh, being used. It's 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 wild. It's like from the end of of of, of uh, Empire Strikes Back, you open up in Return of the Jedi, and there's like 18 new alien races introduced immediately. All of them are being puppeted in Jabba's palace. Jabba himself is one giant animatronic. Uh, and it's awesome. It's so cool. It comes off like so awesome. Uh, and, and it looks cool too, even though of course, uh, there are points where you can kind of tell that Jabba is a uh, giant animatronic. Uh, no one is saying that animatronics look 100% realistic, um, but they sell the physicality very well. Uh, all of the characters are moving around in real space and you don't get the idea that this is just, that it's just a special effect. Uh, there is an illusion that is created that's stronger, uh, even if the Muppets sometimes look a little bit silly. For example, uh, when when Jabba is getting choked by a chain, uh, uh, it does look a little silly. You can kind of tell that like his costume isn't real flesh at that point. But it doesn't really matter that much because there's people standing on the rest of the animatronic. You get the feeling that this is happening in a real space, even if it doesn't look 100% perfect. It's uh, it's wild, yeah. Uh, and of course, yes, uh, Niana in chat points out that one of the things that makes the animatronics uh, sell the illusion better is the fact that they actually interact with the lighting on the same level as the other actors in the scene, which is absolutely true and something that people often neglect uh, when they're talking about films. Um, CG doesn't look worse in some cases just because it's CG. Obviously, some CG is incredible, but one of the problems that people have is replicating realistic lighting and more so replicating realistic lighting that actually looks like the lighting that is on a physical actor. It's very, very difficult. Something you'll notice in a lot of modern movies, of course, is that a lot of scenes are lit very neutrally. Um, stylized lighting uh, has in many cases fallen by the wayside despite it being central to film expression. Having uh, lighting that's, that sells a mood or that sets a mood or that communicates something is core to the art of filmmaking. But it's fallen to the wayside in modern movies because if you're using a lot of computer graphics, it's easiest to just light things very neutrally, to have people not have heavy shadows, or to uh, to make sure that the lighting is is very even keel, so that you can easily plug in uh, diverse uh, computer graphics. And if you take some time to notice this, you'll actually see this in a lot of films. There are so many movies these days that. Uh, that just forego any sort of communication via lighting because uh, they want to make sure that they will be able to do their special effects. And it, it kind of sucks. Um, but not here, not in Return of the Jedi. Um, and of course, uh, the the in my opinion, the opening of Return of the Jedi is not as exciting as the opening of 
Empire Strikes Back, the Hoth opening. However, it's pretty amazing, okay? Uh, the the skiffs is a great setup. The the Basically, you go from inside this d dank, dark, uh, messed up palace of slavery and evil, and you go outside into the blistering, boiling sands, and it's bright all of a sudden, and everybody can't see anything. Han Solo is literally blinded by the brightness because he's been frozen in the dark. Um... And uh, they're fighting across three skiffs. You've got people shooting ropes and fa almost falling down into this this monstrous mouth. The tension is fantastic. Uh, and I want to point another thing out, which is this is just a funny observation because I mentioned this in Empire Strikes Back. Once again, Boba Fett only became famous on pure... Uh, 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 shooting ropes. Okay, I didn't really realize that. You know what I mean. They use the little rope launchers. It's a thing in Star Wars. They literally fire little hook shots that go, you guys know what I mean. Screw, screw you. You know what I mean. Um, oh my god. Come on. Anyway. Uh, 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 so, uh, <laughs> Boba Fett, okay? Boba Fett is a character that that exists on pure swag alone, pure drip. He has nothing else going for him, okay? Most of the, the, the most time that he's on the screen, almost all of Boba's screen time is him just holding a gun kind of like this. He's just kind of standing there intimidatingly with a gun. And then this skiff battle happens over the Snarlac pit, the Sarlac pit. I almost said, I, I did say Snarlac pit. It's a Sarlac pit, but it's this, you know, big mouth in the ground with little whippy arms and whatever um and he just he basically falls in immediately okay like everybody there's this cultural memory of boba fett if you look up boba fett just type boba fett on google you will find thousands of toys posters uh there's an entire series now devoted to boba fett um there's there is a a game that's like centered around boba fett jango fett who's his father is basically just we want to have boba fett in the movie again but it wouldn't really make sense for us to have boba fett in the movie again so we'll make it his dad and he looks basically exactly the same uh and like the Boba Fett obsession is wild. Like people, there's fan art, t-shirts, Boba Fett icons on shirts. It's wild how popular Boba Fett was. And all he does is stand around with a gun and then fall in a hole. But he does it while looking sexy as fuck. That's it. So I, I hold my, my case that Boba Fett got by on pure swag alone. Cool, cool factor is it. He falls in the hole in like five seconds and he literally, the only thing he does is do a little jetpack jump and then uh, tr he shoots a rope that ties up Luke for like two seconds and then he falls in a hole. Almost nothing. Oh my God, it's incredible. It's drip above all else. Yep. Oh my God. It's, it's great. And now keep in mind, I'm not judging anybody for liking Boba Fett. I had, I asked specifically as a kid for a t Boba Fett toy because I thought Boba Fett was so cool. But now as an adult, I realize that I had been spellbound by his unbelievable swag and style and that it wasn't anything substantial that made me attached to Boba Fett. It was just how cool and awesome he looked. And his ship was awesome. His ship looks cool too, but again, it also sucks. His ship is not all that good. He doesn't do anything amazing with his ship. His ship isn't like the best ship in the world. It just looks awesome, okay? I'm just saying. So, uh, Return of the Jedi uh, opens on a really strong note. And then it pivots to a slower portion of, of the movie, uh, which is the planning phase of taking down the new Death Star. Now, that was a bold move of them to just be like, oh, they're making another Death Star already, which is kind of funny. Uh, and I think a lot of people like, I, I feel like if that happened now, everybody would be making fun of that, but it just worked, okay? It didn't need to be anything else. It just obviously they're gonna make another Death Star. Uh, so 
it's it's it, Death Star Two is very America brain. It kind of is very America brain, but it works. They're just like, no, obviously the Empire is going to make another Death Star, and obviously we got to blow it up. Oh, and, oh yeah, and they make it bigger. Yeah, this one will be bigger, and uh, and it won't have a pipe that can be blown up immediately. Uh, so uh, they're making the the new bigger Death Star, and uh, and we get this whole section in the middle of the movie of uh, of of them planning the attack on the new Death Star, of them trying to figure out who's going to do what, of them dealing with the stakes. And one of my favorite parts about Return of the Jedi, which is the payoff of Luke's entire arc in Empire Strikes Back. I mentioned in my Empire Strikes Back review how one of the things that I like the most about Return of the Jedi is that it, 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 it carries through all of the thematic elements and gives them a very satisfying end in a way that most of the Star Wars, uh, the other Star Wars mainline movies completely and utterly fail to do. The prequels have a big, uh, a really hard time like carrying through uh, meaningful character development. It does happen, but it's it's fraught. And of course, we're I don't want to get into the sequels yet, but we'll talk about that in the future. Um, the sequels, let needless to say, fail on their character arcs. However, uh, R Return of the Jedi does not. Return of the Jedi nails it. Uh, so in in Empire Strikes Back, there's this whole scene of of Luke tra uh, training with Yoda and facing his demons. And of course, it culminates with him having to make the decision to either uh, stay with Yoda and complete his training or leave to protect his friends. And Yoda warns him, don't be manipulated by fear. Fear will lead you to the dark side. It will, uh, your fear can be used against you. And, uh, and the payoff is present throughout the entirety of Return of the Jedi. In fact, arguably the entire plot of Return of the Jedi is the result of, uh, like, is the result of that decision alone. Uh, because Luke leaves uh, his training, uh, obviously Han gets kidnapped and he loses his own hand, which many people would have been like, oh, okay, that's that's the conclusion. You went too early, you couldn't beat uh, 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 Darth Vader, you lose your hand. But I don't think that was the real price that he paid for that decision. The real price that he pays for his decision is present through the main storyline of Return of the Jedi. So let me explain this in greater detail. From the moment that they leave Jabba's palace and they begin the, the, the planning phase of the attack on the Death Star, uh, Luke is unable to hide his presence in the Force because he hasn't completed his training. Um, and of course, he never truly gets to complete his training. Uh, he tries to go back to Dagobah and, uh, and of course, uh, Yoda is, is old and dies almost immediately. He arrives only within like a day before Yoda passes away and becomes a part of the Force. So he's never able to complete his training in the Force in full. And as a result, the entire movie, both Darth Vader and uh, the Emperor are able to track him and sense his presence. They can read his emotions from afar. They can divine his location throughout the entire film. And I actually think that's a really masterful touch because it shows, uh, it, it sort of demonstrates exactly what Yoda was worried about. That wielding a great power like the Force, being able to wield the Force, just having power in and of itself is nothing if you don't truly and fully understand it. If you'll, if you will stay, stay with me on this particular point, uh, the fact that that Luke is unable to shield his presence from the Emperor and Darth Vader leads to uh, a bunch of rebels dying. It leads to his friends uh, nearly dying. It leads to, um, it, it leads to uh, the 
uh, uh, the entire uh, battle, the, the it's a trap, that moment is only because uh, basically Luke is broadcasting his thoughts and intentions to the universe or directly to Darth Vader and the Emperor. Uh, it's, it's so, it's such a good touch. It shows that Luke's, even though Luke is incredibly powerful, he has in many ways mastered certain aspects of the force. He can, uh, he can lift objects with the force. He can push people with the force. He can easily summon his lightsaber. He can uh, do, he can divine the future to a certain degree with the force, but he never fully learned what it means to be disciplined until of course the end of the film, which we'll talk about in just a second. And his lack of ability to control that power means that his power gets other people hurt. It's not just him. He doesn't just lose a hand uh, or, or you know, and, and have to face the terrible uh, trauma of discovering that his dad is the, one of the most evil guys in the universe. He also causes the deaths of many rebels. He also causes incredible suffering for the Ewoks. He also causes incredible suffering for both Leia and Han Solo. Um, all, uh, all to demonstrate the fact that is, in my opinion, uh, essential uh, to the understanding uh, of, of the sort of thematic uh, messages of the original trilogy, which is, of course, that power is uh, is incredibly dangerous. That power in and of itself is a dangerous and dangerous tool that has to be taken seriously and respected. And also that power uh, in the hands of an individual will, can and will lead to the deaths of many other innocent people. Uh, people who didn't do anything wrong. People who were good people. You have to think about how many people died because uh, the emperor was able to tell the plan, the, the, uh, in advance, the attack that the rebels were planning. Um, that he was able to manipulate uh, Luke into it, Luke's behaviors into a trapped situation where Luke being a a a member of leadership in the rebellion uh, Put other people in danger people good freedom fighting people died because of Luke never completed that training and I wanted to I had a conversation with my partner doe earlier today about how there are mirrors between this this fact in Return of the Jedi and uh, Anakin's arc throughout the prequel trilogy. And it's actually kind of interesting because it is true that in both cases, in, in the original trilogy and in the prequel trilogy, the Jedi Order sort of commands their, uh, their people to have emotional control. But interestingly, in the prequel trilogy, it is a dogmatic uh, uh, insistence of, of emotional repression. It is a dogmatic form of control. Uh, do not feel sad about your mother. You need to focus on your training. You don't, you shouldn't feel uh, bad about the things that happened. Don't be sad about Qui-Gon Jinn. Uh, it's actually, uh, I talked about this in all of my reviews, that it's a constant reoccurring theme in the prequel trilogy. One of the themes I do really like from the prequel trilogy, that the uh, Jedi Order has become completely dogmatic. And you'll notice that when Yoda tells Luke to gain control of his emotions to not immediately run, even though the message is very similar. It sounds in some levels like Yoda is saying, forget the emotions of your friends. But in truth, what he's saying is be cautious. You have a great power. And if you act on the first emotion that comes to your heart, you could put these people in your life that you care about in more danger because you are vulnerable to having your emotions manipulated via the force. So it's it's interesting how those two are like the dark the dark side of this uh, of this Jedi emotional control that the Jedi of the original trilogy the Yoda the actually wise Master Yoda um, doesn't preach dogmatic repression in instead he 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 preaches uh, one gaining. Uh, mastery over their emotions, gaining mastery over what is going on inside of them so that they can make clear-headed decisions. And uh, it's really, really good. I, I, I actually really like that through line and I like that juxtaposition. And I think that it carries through all the way to the end 
of of Return of the Jedi, which is uh, of course the confrontation between Luke and the Emperor and uh, and and Darth Vader. I'm gonna draw another parallel between Return of the Jedi and Revenge of the Sith. At the beginning of Revenge of the Sith, the very same Emperor, uh, 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 who later would would tell Luke, "Do it. Use the dark side and defeat Darth Vader and take your rightful place. You are more powerful than Darth Vader. You must use your anger to defeat him." Um, Almost the same scene happens, or I shouldn't say almost the same scene, but a very similar scene happens with Anakin, okay? So in, in Return of the Jedi, you have uh, the Emperor trying to tempt Luke to use the dark side, and in fact, he somewhat succeeds. Luke gets super angry, and there's that iconic scene where he's just beating down Darth Vader with the lightsaber. Um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and then, of course, uh, you have the scene with Count Dooku in Revenge of the Sith, where uh, where Anakin completely disarms, literally, he, he, he cuts off Count Dooku's arms, and he has the two lightsabers, and the Emperor tells him to do it. And there's an interesting parallel between the two, because in both cases, uh, Luke and Anakin, respectively, have very good reason to want to destroy the person in front of them. Uh, Darth Vader, of course, uh, has has done uh, immeasurable harm to the galaxy. Darth Vader has done immeasurable harm to Luke. Darth Vader has done Im immeasurable harm to Luke's friends. Likewise, Count Dooku has done the exact same to Anakin. But it's interesting in how they each handle it differently, and it reflects what I was just talking about, about the difference in messaging between these movies. Luke chooses not to kill Darth Vader. And he doesn't choose not to kill Darth Vader because he was told not to, or because he was being told by a bad guy. He chooses it because he gains mastery over himself. He recognizes his emotions, he recognizes his anger, and he chooses not to act because it goes against his personal beliefs. Through the entire series, Luke always believes that he thinks that there is still good inside of Darth Vader that could be reached, that could be accessed, that there is room for redemption. And that is his genuine belief. Um, and he chooses not to kill Darth Vader in the exact same position. And if you look at what happens with Anakin, Anakin kills Count Dooku and only afterwards goes, oh, I shouldn't have done that. The, that was against the Jedi code because Anakin has no actual foundation for, uh, he only knows repression. He only knows uh, his emotions being counteracted with the message of repression. You shouldn't have done that. He knows only guilt. He has no mastery over his, his, his decisions. He knows only guilt and acting out of defiance of that guilt. I am angry. I will kill Count Dooku. And then afterwards, I'll think about, ooh, I sh that was against the rules. I, I shouldn't have done that. Mm, that might have been a bad thing. He doesn't actually have a, a, a full fully formed uh, mastery of his own beliefs and his morals. He doesn't know what he truly believes. He has only had a dogmatic teaching from the, uh, from the Jedi Order. And I just think that, uh, that taken together, it's fantastic. And also that the writing in Return of the Jedi for that particular aspect, for how it depicts uh, Luke becoming the actual chosen one. Luke in that moment comes into his own. He becomes a full character in that moment because he recognizes, I have agency. I do not have to give over to the dark side, even though I want to. I can acknowledge my fear. I can acknowledge my anger. I can acknowledge my hate, and I can choose to act otherwise. I can choose to act in accordance with my beliefs. And it becomes a very strong and powerful moment for Luke there. And of course, uh, compared with this, with a very similar scene where the empire, where the emperor is attempting to exert his influence to to push someone to give over to the dark side, um, is is very very awesome. I think it's really impressive, um, and uh, I really like it. Uh, and uh, so 
there's all of that. Uh, there's just so much to dig into in The Return of the Jedi. Do you see why I opened this little segment up talking about uh, why I, I think that in with Return of the Jedi, the deepening of the universe, the sort of like attempt to make it into a full uh, storyline world with all this extra deep world building actually adds a lot. Uh, the fact that they decided to go all the way in and introduce the Emperor as a character, uh, to dive into all these other worlds and you see the whole time that they spend with the Ewoks and all of this, I think it pays off because it allows to, uh, Star Wars to go beyond just being a adventure film to instead being a uh, a moral a moral tale a simple moral tale but a moral tale nonetheless and I like it um, so uh, the heart of Return of the Jedi and the reason why I part of the reason why I, I love this film so much is because of how much respect it has for the characters and the stories and the experience of those characters as they've gone through them. I mean, a, another example of one of the side characters, obviously Han Solo. Han Solo goes from being uh, in in uh, Empire, uh, a, you know, uh, uh, a reluctant good guy, a guy who's, you know, he's, he hasn't fully given up his, his sort of like self-serving ways. He's, uh, he's, he's gotten way better and he cares a lot more about, about his friends and whatnot, but he's still very much, uh, he's, he's an immature character to in, in, uh, uh, Return of the Jedi to being a, a wholly devoted to the cause that he's involved himself in, that he is, he is now a warrior uh, for freedom. He knows what he believes in as a character. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, and, uh, uh, uh I, I don't know. I, I, I really, really like Return of the Jedi. Um, it's, it's, it's impressive. And I, I, uh, I don't know. I struggle to decide whether I like Return of the Jedi or Empire Strikes Back more. There's so much to enjoy in each of them. I, I think that as a like standalone film, uh, just taken by itself, Empire Strikes Back is probably my favorite with just as a, a standalone movie. But once you can, once you allow for for how well Return of the Jedi plugs into the rest of Luke's story, the rest of the gang, the gang story. I, I think it, it rises above and it and it, it, it adds something that I really, really like. It adds a satisfying depth uh, that I, I can't help but feel really, really good about. Um, and uh, another thing, um, I, I, I like the Ewoks, okay, everybody? I know this might be a hot take because I know some people are big Ewok haters, but I really like the Ewoks, and I actually really like the Ewok side story. I think it's great. Um, and one of the reasons why I like it is because it shows how the mentality of the of the rebellion operates. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, no Ewok ever called me Nerf Herder. <laughs> it's fucking true. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, my God. Okay, let me tell you why I like the Ewoks, okay, as a story element, okay? So... One of the things that Star Wars, uh, that, uh, that Star Wars, okay, one of the things that, that the original trilogy struggles with is, uh, is fleshing out what the rebellion actually looks like, okay? Um, you literally, you barely see anything about the rebellion. You basically know nothing about the rebellion except that it is a thing that exists and that they're fighting against the Emperor, um, until... Return of the Jedi and in Return of the Jedi you have three generals Luke uh, Leia and Han Solo um, Go to an alien planet and encounter an alien race that none of them know and the way that they choose to Engage with that alien race shows the value that the rebellion has over the Empire. The Empire arrives on Endor to turn Endor, to completely instrumentalize Endor. To the Empire, Endor is not a forest moon. It is it is simply a place where they can build a shield generator so they can build their project. 
it is it is seen as nothing other than resources. That is it. The re the rebel generals arrive on, on Endor. They do not know about the Ewoks, and they immediately decide that they are going to work with the Ewoks, that they are going to find a way to communicate with these Ewoks. And then they end up literally, I mean, there's a, it's developed that they even become a, tr a part of the tribe. They are formally uh, welcomed into the tribe after the initial, you know, hostile situation where the Ewoks are like, oh, we, they're, they're evil, we get it, we're gonna eat them. And they overcome that to instead make an alliance with the Ewoks, which of course makes it possible for them to overcome the Empire. And it's the first time that we actually get to see that in Star Wars, that we see that the way that the rebellion works is that they side, that they side with, with, with the people. They side with the actual people that live on these planets. They care about the actual living beings on these planets more than the resources. They didn't go, they weren't sent on a mission to recruit the Ewoks. They didn't, their primary goal wasn't even to recruit the Ewoks. All they wanted to do was not have hostility with the Ewoks. All they wanted to do was treat the Ewoks peacefully as beings that are that they treat functionally as equals and it's cool i i like that i i really really like that they do that they go that far to basically be like here's what there's the message that we're showing the rebellion works with the living beings on these planets it the rebellion works with the indigenous people on these planets in a peaceful manner they might not always they might bump heads, there might be individual miscommunications, there might even be some danger. Um, but the Rebellion's approach is one that is completely and diametrically opposed to that of the of the Empire. And we only really get to see that in Return of the Jedi. We don't really get to see that in any of the other films. Um, and, uh, and of course, the implication that we see off screen is that uh, we see the, the structures that the Empire has built on Endor. We know what it actually happened, which is that the Empire landed on Endor, killed a ton of Ewoks, um, and and just instrumentalized the planet immediately. That this is a we are that 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 our characters are arriving on the site of a genocide, unironically, um, and uh, yeah, and and so. Uh, 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 and, and so what we see, of course, is that like the reb the rebellion, the leaders of the rebellion are able to overcome the natural hostility that comes from the Ewoks being like, we don't trust outsiders. The last outsiders who arrived here tried to kill us. They overcome that. They overcome that with diplomacy, with uh, a little bit of guile. Obviously, you know, Luke uses the force to uh, make it seem like C-3PO is a god so that they'll calm down. And then afterwards, he tells them all the stories and they come to an understanding, um, but they don't use force. They never kill an Ewok. They never beat an Ewok. They never threaten. Well, okay, Han threatens an Ewok, but not majorly. He doesn't threaten to like kill anybody. Um, yeah, uh, so they give him some food uh, they they use the force uh, in a positive manner uh, and they overcome their boundaries uh, in order to ultimately build an alliance. And they're, again, I will point out their main goal was not uh, to, to go there to get the Ewoks to join them. They didn't even know the Ewoks were there. It's incidental. It shows that the philosophy of the rebellion is one that supports oppressed people. It, the philosophy of the rebellion is one that supports uh, uh, a, 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 a uh, non-violent solutions. That the, 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 the rebellion wants peace and they fight because they have to, because they want to defend the people that are valuable to them. I think it's really, really good. Um, and also the Ewoks are really cute. Uh, I don't care when anybody says the Ewoks are awesome. There's a huge variety to the Ewok costumes. If you actually uh, look really close, like if you pay attention in the scenes, there's like 20 different Ewok outfits that were made. It's it's unbelievable 
how many different Ewok outfits were made for the for this movie. And they're great. I think they're cute and amazing. The sets are cool. Uh, they're they're uh, they have a funny little language. They do little uh, you know they have the cute little Ewok uh, interaction with Leia. Of course, Leia is the most uh, uh, the most diplomatic and loving towards the Ewoks. Um, and I mean, uh, uh, also, uh, C-3PO, finally, we get to see his, his ability to translate come in, uh, uh, to come in handy throughout all the movies. C-3PO keeps saying, I am versed in over 30,000 galactic languages. Uh, and if we finally get to see him, he doesn't even know the official language, but he knows enough that he's able to start learning their language, uh, on the fly. Awesome. I, I I love I love Return of the Jedi. It's awesome. I think that that all of the aspects of it uh, only flesh the universe out better. Uh, and regardless of everything else that we know that happens with Star Wars, uh, what a great way to inspire a generation of really really awesome media. Now um, we all know what's coming next. Uh, I am going to be reviewing the Disney Star Wars movies next. That's what's coming up soon. Um, and, uh, 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 but I want to point something out, which is that, uh, between the Disney purchase of Star Wars, there was a lot of Star Wars stuff made, okay? And let me tell you that even between the the return of the jedi and the prequel trilogy there was a absolute glut of star wars related media and a lot of it is really fantastic okay a lot of the old school star wars games that built on the universe a lot of the star wars comics the star wars books that built on the universe these are really really cool things um that built on the foundation that was set by return of the jedi because Return of the Jedi, like I said, it was the movie that started building out a foundation for this universe to be built on. And I think it did a good job, even though we know what ends up happening to Star Wars. And of course, I'm going to talk about all of that in great depth. Um, so, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, God, there's just so much I could talk about. Dark Forces. Um, is is a is an absolutely incredible Star Wars game that's just dripping in style and artistry. Uh, the the SNES games, the uh, the Rogue uh, what Rogue uh, what's it called? Uh, why am I why am I messing up on this? Um, Rogue Squadron, which came out technically came out after uh, the 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 Phantom Menace, but doesn't matter. It was mostly it was almost all. OG trilogy stuff. It had almost nothing to do with uh, with the prequel stuff. Uh, the prequel stuff was like added in at the very tail end. Uh, uh, so much stuff. God, it's just it's amazing, just incredible. Um, and uh, it stands out. I think that Return of the Jedi is a really amazing film, and I think that it's it it really is. Uh, responsible in a lot of ways for building the legacy of star wars in a way that that a new hope and empire strikes back couldn't really do it because they didn't really commit to the depth that return of the jedi did but return of the jedi did and also let me point out that return of the jedi is such a satisfying conclusion to the original trilogy it just it the ending is fantastic everything from luke of course, mastering himself, becoming a uh, a true Jedi Knight by showing that he has control over his emotions, that even when he is being actively tempted by uh, the greatest evil force in the universe, even when he is being tortured by lightning, he can think clearly, he can master his emotions to make the right decision, that he was correct to assume that there was still goodness in Darth Vader, to Darth Vader's moment of redemption, Darth Vader making the decision, no, actually, after everything, after all of this nonsense, sense after all of the evil that i've done maybe i can do an act of good maybe i can introduce some level of hope back into the universe um and of course the obliteration of the death star and the death of the emperor 
uh, which spells the end for the Empire, we get to see the rebellion reach its win state. The Empire is toppled. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's such an awesome and satisfying conclusion um, that just ends that whole series on a fantastic note, uh, a very hopeful note. Um, I love it. So uh, my lovely imps, uh, uh, Return of the Jedi. Uh, oh, oh, I should say, I didn't even mention. I should mention one other thing. Soundtrack for Return of the Jedi bop now of course it doesn't shine as brightly as uh empire strikes back because empire strikes back is where john williams really like all of the bangers that we associate with star wars were like came from uh, from empire strikes back but the the quality still carries through so even if it's not as unique and as, as stunningly new as empire strikes back soundtrack is fantastic okay uh, and, uh, and obviously the costuming is great. Uh, 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 I already mentioned the Ewoks. I already mentioned the Jabba stuff, but like all of the Imperial costumes, all of the different rebel outfits, they've got speeder bikes, they've got ATSTs, they've got thermal detonators all over the place. Just so much style, so much care put, in, put into these amazing costumes. Return of the Jedi is a banger. And my opinion is that, uh, it is the spiritual anchor of the entire future of Star Wars. Without Return of the Jedi, uh, I don't think we ever would have really seen uh, an Andor. I don't think we, we would have ever seen any of the awesome games that came in between. The Return of the Jedi set the tone for what what it means to be a Jedi, what it means to be a hero in the Star Wars universe, and also what it means to be a rebel in the Star Wars universe. And I think it does better than most people give it credit. I think a lot of people tend to focus on the uh, the pure action, the, the because there's a lot of good action. There's a lot of fun star fighting. Um, there's all that stuff. But I, I really think that like on a story level, the spiritual anchor of the entire Star Wars series is to be found in Return of the Jedi. So that's my review of Return of the Jedi. If you've been enjoying my Star Wars reviews, press the like button. If it works, press the like button right now. And also make sure that you press subscribe, ring the bell, and leave me your thoughts. Is there something that I missed? Is there something that you thought was cool? Please tell me your thoughts in the comments down below. I would absolutely love to hear what you have to say about Star Wars Return of the Jedi and the Mama review of Star Wars Return of the Jedi. Uh, thank you all very much, my lovely imps. That's Star Wars. Now, coming next will be the Disney Star Wars sequel trilogy, which I'm sure you all are going to be very happy to hear about. Uh, these are going to be a riot. Unfortunately, I hate to say it, I don't want to spoil anything, but these are going to be a lot harsher than my previous reviews for very understandable reasons. Uh, but you have that to look forward to. If you're looking forward to me being a lot harsher for the last three films, actually for the last six films, I've been gushing about a lot of the things that I like, except for Attack of the Clones, which I really, really dug into Attack of the Clones. But uh, for at least five of the last reviews, I've been very, I've, I've had a lot of positive things to say. I know that I will have positive things to say about the sequel trilogy, but I also, I have seen them relatively recently already. I'm going to watch them again for these. And I already know you guys are going to get a little bit of Critic Mama coming forward. So stay tuned and keep your eyes peeled for those, all right?